Hello there, this is MJ. I am uh, typically releasing uh, comic book reviews on this channel or uh, podcast feed, or I don't know, let's just say feed. And uh, right now I'm not doing that. It's been a while since I've uh, touched a comic book, even a digital one. That's not true. I actually skim them uh, quite frequently when I'm doing research for different stuff, uh, mining data, whatnot. But the important part, what I'm actually here for, is to share with you my thoughts on Howard Pyle's uh, The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood and how that relates to the CW's Arrow. I don't know much about Arrow, the DC Comics superhero character guy, um, except for the fact that he has, you know, silly trick arrows in the comic books and that he and a Green Lantern in like the 70s went in like a pickup truck across the country to talk about like kind of social justice type issues. Uh, I believe they talked about like drugs, racism, um, I don't know, a variety of very topical social issues uh, of the day and, you know, that maybe are even relevant today. I don't know. But sounds interesting. Uh, kind of a big deal, you know, Green Arrow, Green Lantern, ha ha ha, they're both green. Uh, one guy's a normal dude with no powers, and one dude's a, you know, super powerful alien weapon dude with the ring. Like I said, I don't know too much about DC, but uh, I have watched all, I think it's eight seasons of Arrow. Uh, I actually just finished marathoning um, Arrow uh, on Netflix, because that's where I watch it, because I can't stand the commercials. Anyway, so I've always been interested in Robin Hood. Um, just for funsies, when I was a little kid, I had both a Peter Pan and a Robin Hood costume, or I think I used it as both, uh, like the Fox Robin Hood from uh, the Disney movie, and you know, I love that Peter Pan movie too, and they both have, you know, the green fe- cap with the feather in it and everything, and I, I wore those, uh, I wore that till I was too large to wear it, and uh, probably pretty chubby too, bur- burst in the seams and stuff, so. Um, I've always loved the idea of Robin Hood. Uh, as I developed in my political philosophy and I learned about the ideas of the idea of uh, some people saying that taxation is theft it made me think about Robin Hood and how Robin Hood uh, basically was stealing money in some stories from uh, the wealthy who would press it out of the peasantry and he would give it to them and uh, there are a bunch of different accounts of Robin Hood I ended up actually checking out uh, through LibriVox, which is a website associated with archive.org. It's where they host a lot of their audio, if not all of their audio. I don't know for sure where they have all of their audio hosted. I have my audio for the various things that I do hosted in different places, so why wouldn't they? They might. I don't know. Anyway, the point is, uh, LibriVox uh, publishes uh, public domain books in audiobook format read by volunteers. Sometimes you get one volunteer who reads an entire book. Like there's a gentleman who's read uh, a few, like five or so Oz books uh, from L. Frank Baum's The Wizard of Oz series. And he's also, the same guy also happened to read uh, books of the Bible. I went and looked at the apocryphal books of uh, Maccabees 1 and 2, and I was shocked to find that the same guy, the same gentleman, the same kind soul who has a heart to volunteer for stuff um, like this to make it more widely available and accessible to people, uh, went ahead and, uh, you know, did both these things, which I wouldn't think the one guy who would be interested in one would be interested in the other, but then again, I listened to both things, so what do you know? Anyway, so like I said, I just recently, like a month or so ago, finished watching all of Arrow, uh, and I just, like a week ago, finished listening to the entirety of like I said, Howard Pyle's uh, The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. Howard Pyle, from what I could tell on the wiki, was a Victorian gentleman. Like, he published this in the 18-somethings, and I believe he was of noble birth, or at least somewhat noble birth. And, uh, yeah, he took these stories and he collected them, and I wouldn't say he kidified them necessarily, um, but he had an interesting... Robin Hood and cast of Merry Men who didn't really kill people. And uh, I think I am going to have to pause for a moment, collect my thoughts, and then I will tell you more. Uh, I'll give a very brief, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give a very brief uh, spoiler-ish overview of both the CW Arrow and uh, Howard Pyle's Robin Hood, and then I'll go from there. So in the CW Arrow show... What happens is that there's this young guy who's a uh, scion to a wealthy family. His name is Oliver Queen. Uh, He and his father go out on a boat. That boat gets crashed. He gets stranded on an island. Uh, 
And on that island, he learns to survive. After five years of being away from his home, he ends up going back to his city, Star City, Starling City, one of the two, I can't remember which. And he learns that there are a bunch of bad, bad people with lots of money who have been hurting the citizens of his city. Uh, there's, of, of course, uh, the cheap side or the, uh, you know, poor area and the uh, wealthier area where he and his family and most of his socialite friends live. And he leads a crusade uh, in order to right the wrongs of his father and his father's cohorts, who were people who had benefited off of exploiting, abusing, uh, etc., etc., the, you know, poor, powerless people. And he actually wages a very bloody campaign to fight against that. Along the way, he uh, meets friends and allies. He wants to be a loner, but he doesn't uh, remain a loner. He gets a uh, best friend, uh, basically John Diggle, uh, who is like his little John. I, I think even uh, the fact that John Diggle um, is called Dig, uh, you know, called by his last name, and John Little became Little John when he joined the Merry Men, and that he was like a very close second to uh, Robin Hood, just like uh, Diggle is a very close second to, uh, you know, Oliver Queen, uh, and even gets to, well, he gets to be a good archer too, let's just say that. Um, you know, there's already a parallel right there, uh, but along the, uh, the story of uh, Oliver Queen from Arrow, he uh, he grows, he develops as a person, he puts, uh, <laughs> he stops killing people, stops murdering people perhaps, and, and that issue is addressed in the story, uh, which of course is a very modern story, it's a postmodern story in fact, as opposed to the, well, I'm not going to say it's entirely postmodern, but it exists within a postmodern world which is willing to... Um, examine narratives and things like that, which isn't the case for the Victorian, you know, children's novel, basically, that Pyle wrote. But anyway, in it, he uh, gets a family, he finds a purpose, and he ultimately dies a hero who inspires others to live a heroic life and uh, to be a paragon of, of virtue, I, I guess I would say, is something that he inspires people to do. And uh, that's kind of the story of Oliver Queen. He, he marries and has kids, and like I said, there'd be light spoilers. So um, that's Oliver Queen from Arrow, and then going back to Howard Pyle's Robin Hood, he starts off, uh, I don't believe they say that he's landed gentry. Um, I believe there's very, very, very little story given on him in his life other than the fact that he has relations, and he has relations who are of noble-ish blood. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure Will Scarlet. Anyway, uh, they seem to be of no noblish blood, and maybe I just missed it not being as familiar with how landed gentry works. Um, you know, I've, I've seen Downton Abbey, and uh, like that's about it, you know, so my knowledge on those things is a little poor or a little lacking, especially for what would have been in the, the Middle Ages, how, how they would have been set up there. Uh, anyway, so the... In the first chapter, he's challenged by a woodsman, and in the hot blood of his youth, uh, actually a woodsman who's working for the sheriff, and he ends up drawing his bow and killing the man from like two or three hundred yards away. Apparently it's an amazing shot, uh, because young Robin is already an amazing archer. We don't know why he's an amazing archer, we don't know where those skills came from, uh, why he practiced, like I said, we know very little about his interior life, and we kind of don't get to learn a lot about him and his personal life throughout the story. We get to see glimpses of him and his sense of justice and his, his sense of honor as he goes through. Um, but basically, he and his merry men uh, do um, rob from the rich to feed the poor, so to speak. What, what one, of the, one of their greatest tactics is that they invite uh, very fat uh, clergymen and uh, because they're wealthy and they're fat. Because, they're fat because they're wealthy and taking money from the people and using it on themselves. Uh, that's the idea that Robin and his men have anyway. And then uh, also any noblemen um, who, again, are you know, they can tell are being selfish and not you know, sharing with the people and are maybe taking too much from the people. They seize these men and they invite them to a uh, lusty dinner out in their... Um, you know, beautiful Sherwood Forest, uh, their forest home, and uh, their song and dance and drinking. And by the way, you know, I thought Oliver Queen had a lot of allies when he had like nine people on Team Arrow. 
Uh, Robin Hood gets to have like 140 men, seven score men, uh, as part of his band of merry men. And um, anyway, they then press these men to uh, pay for their dinner and they basically have them pay all the money in their purse, which is sometimes lots and lots of gold uh, coins, uh, gold pounds even. Um, and there's like, they mentioned farthings as a unit of money, but then also gold, uh, gold, uh, crowns and then silver angels, which I don't know. What, I don't know what those are anyway. Um, but anyway, they press these men. There's a little bit of interactions with the sheriff of Nottingham, but, uh, Robin Hood and his men are fairly quickly able to defeat him and he becomes less of a nuisance. Uh, within like the first five or so chapters, it's about a 21, 22 chapter book with a, maybe a, an epilogue and maybe a prologue. Um, and from then on, there's just kind of misadventures and they're kind of fun and there's not too much seriousness. There's some dangers that they get into, but it's kind of more about like, uh, nobility and rugged manliness and these men hanging out and doing these things. Uh, there's a tiny bit of romance. Unfortunately, Maid Marian is mentioned once, I think, but uh, Robin, like, they don't ever marry in the story, and he never rescues her from the sheriff or Prince John or anything like that. In fact, his enemy in uh, in this book is actually King Henry, um, who, because King Richard is off fighting the Crusades, and it's very interesting, after living a very... Uh, he kills the one man in the beginning of the book. He lives a very peaceful life where he presses. He like he's more of a trickster a little bit, um, but he's very skilled, and so are his men. And they're all strong, and they all get into these fights with people. And they're like pretty daring fights where they don't just like the sheriff's men or whatever. They can kind of defeat and and overcome fairly easily. But there are like maybe six to ten exceptional men who are mentioned throughout the story, um, who stand out among the merry men, uh, and. It's, you know, Robin plus these guys, and then there's, like, the other 130-some or 20-some, uh, you know, merry men who are just kind of unnamed because they're not as important and they're not shown to be, like, as amazing, like, standout figures. Um, which is pretty interesting, I think. But anyway, Robin kind of encounters these men. Uh, either, you know, they fight in some way, and then they become friends, and he invites them to join his band. And there's this weird reference to, like, a league of, not assassins, this is an arrow, a league of, uh, yeoman, like, beggars who lie about being beggars, so it's funny, there's this one scene where he comes upon these guys while he's wandering, like, just for fun to see what kind of trouble or, or adventure he can get into and see if he, and he and Little John part ways twice to go off different directions and see what they can find and bring back to camp, uh, that night, and he finds a blind man, a deaf man, and a lame man, the uh, deaf man hears him coming. The blind man is the first to see him. Oh, there's also a, a mute, uh, or dumb. That's what that means, mute. Uh, he speaks up and says, hey, look at that guy! And then the, um, <laughs> the lame guy folds out his leg and, and turns out that it's not, you know, actually gone. He was just hiding it, tucked it, tucked away under his cloak or whatever. And that was a weird thing, but apparently there was this, like, myth, or, or this, you know, this group of guys clandestine, and they have their own, like, um... I don't remember how you say it, but there's this... Anyway, they have their own dialect. Let's just call it that simply. Um, and their own way of speaking and their own manner of, of secret information that they know. And, like, there's a network of beggars or whatever. And Robin had heard of them, but never... He didn't know they were real. And he encountered them because uh, he took... He bought the clothes off of one of their fellow members. And, uh, anyway, it was just... It was a really funny misadventure. And uh, it was a lot of fun. But then, it's really interesting. At the end of the story, he becomes like an outlaw. Like, I mean, he's always been an outlaw throughout the story, but, he, like, his life is, like, he is going to die. He's surrounded by men, um, but a knight who he'd helped out long ago and whose son he helped to save, or, well, no, uh, just ignore that for now. Anyway, a knight who he'd helped to save some time before ends up trying to secret him away, and then um, his life is spared. Uh, King Richard actually returns, and things, he, he ends up welcoming... Um, Robin into his service, and uh, actually, Robin does kill one other man, a uh, guy of Gisborne, who is, uh, they, th he's described as a very nasty killer, who kills for fun, who kills, he's a mercenary, and he's willing to kill anyone, basically, for any price, uh, and he enjoys killing people, it makes him happy, and anyway, Robin can't allow this guy to live, so he chooses to take his life, and he's not sorry for it, and then, Later on, like shortly after that, his life becomes very much in danger, and then he's saved by the King Richard, who I think he'd impressed. 
um, somehow I can't remember what the antics were, but he impressed him. And uh, anyway, King Richard welcomes him into his service and offers to deputize the Merry Men and have them be like royal rangers, which is pretty interesting. And what happens after that is that Robin goes away with him to another round of fighting the Crusades, or maybe it was a separate cru There were multiple Crusades, if you don't know that, look it up. Um, as I'm fond of saying, there was even a children's crusade, which is pretty sad, but I think it's an interesting thing to point out. Anyway, uh, Robin goes with him to the crusades and he kills a lot of people, uh, in battle. He comes back, uh, he abandons the king's service. He, uh, gives up his noble title that he's been given. He's Sir Robert of Loxley, Loxley or something like that. He's a duke of something. And he gives that all up to go back to the forest and be with the Merry Men. At that time, Prince John, made famous by the uh, you know Disney Robin Hood movie, uh, is there, and he and the Sheriff of uh, Nottingham end up trying to fight against Robin and his Merry Men, and they have a battle. Uh, Robin and his men defeat them, and everything's good, except for Robin is injured, and he ends up being betrayed by somebody who he had helped out, a family member of his, and sadly he dies, and uh, Little John is there with him at the end, and he's actually going to fly into a rage, or he is in a rage, and Little John is threatening to kill all these people who were complicit in Robin's death, because it was done by trickery and guile, and actually at the hands of a female relative who was surrounded by, I can't remember if they're nuns or nurses or what, but anyway, uh, Little John, who is described as having been charming to women, has been described as being sweet, uh, who cried at rescuing one of uh, the the other, uh, like founding members of, uh, Robin Hood's band. Um, you know, so like a sweetheart of a guy, you know, a big guy for sure loves food and stuff like that, but a sweet guy, uh, he's so upset. And I don't know if I can't remember now if little John had gone off to the crusades with Robin or not, but things have happened. And like these men have fallen from kind of this lofty, uh, ideal position where they were doing right by people and not hurting people needlessly and not killing people needlessly where he wa he wants to tear through this place and just kill all these women for what they've done to Robin and Robin Hood stops him and uh tells him that that's not the way and he's like you're like that's not you little John like that's that's not my friend I know you're better than that and he quiets his anger and they share some really tender moments before Robin ultimately succumbs to his wounds and uh he does this thing where he shoots an arrow um and where it lands is where he wants to be buried, and he is buried there. And uh, I don't know, it's just, it was a really interesting story, and it honestly makes me emotional. Uh, both stories make me emotional, but I really enjoyed something about the Robin Hood story uh, more than I did Arrow. I think Arrow's a lot more grim, a lot more dark, uh, which is fine. Like, I get what they were going for, but I really did uh, enjoy this, you know, children's story of the adventures of Robin Hood, the merry adventures of Robin Hood. And... I feel like it's a, a charming tale. It's classic. It's about, like, it's interesting that it was written by a Victorian English dude. And I don't know if this is true, that the, because I, I actually, I should ask somebody, uh, although one anecdote isn't, you know, sufficient. Um, I know a couple of British people, though, uh, tangentially. And I should ask, you know, is it really a uh, stiff upper lip and, you know, don't have emotions and things like that? Because there's a American... Um, trope or, uh, you know, concept of men not having feelings and things like that. But it was really interesting to me that Pyle, living in, I believe, the 1800s, wrote about these men living in the uh, 1300s, and they showed the full range of emotion. They wept for each other, they loved each other as brothers, um, and uh, they even, like, like I said, they wept for each other, they wept for each other's sorrows even, and uh, one of the most enjoyable adventures is one that's done for a, a minstrel or a, a bard or whatever who is in love with this gentle woman uh you know but by that i mean she's of noble birth she's of the gentry or is a gentry is also the gentle and i think that's what it is anyway um but he's in love with her and her father's going to force her to marry an old man who is wealthy and who she's not interested in and uh they go on this whole quest to save her from him and to get the two of them married off, and they even offer to support them and take them in uh, to Sherwood Forest in order to enable them to live out a happy life together. And it was just really sweet, and I really appreciated it.
So to be a little more direct about the parallels and, and differences, uh, they both fight injustice of one form or another. There is a corrupt, uh, there are, you know, low people, common people who are being oppressed and, you know, stolen from and exploited by the corrupt upper class. Uh, there are people who are, you know, philanthropic or righteous or godly even um, in both stories, but they turn out to be corrupt and to be thieving and to be two-faced and to be truly villainous and hiding that villainy, um, which is interesting. Uh, Robin seems to be, uh, well, Robin Hood is uh, a moniker or a title or whatever, like that's not really his name. Uh, you know, John Little gets renamed to Little John. Basically what I'm edging at is that they, uh, they all have kind of costumes and names of superheroes or, you know, alternate names that they use, possibly just because they're outlaws and they're trying to uh, conceal their identity to some extent. Um, Robin has a cousin who ends up coming and he wears red and they call him Will Scarlet. I don't know. Uh, so it says all the men get three suits of Lincoln green every year. Um, and it's funny, they mentioned that the sheriff's men wear Lincoln green in the beginning. I don't know if that was just something all foresters would have worn. There's even a town of Lincoln, um, mention and I don't know how that might relate also to the Lincoln Green. Um, I'm missing that context, but I'm just kind of sharing what I can. And, uh, oh, he gives them like money too. Like, so like a stipend of cash every year that the merry men work with him and live with him in the forest and whatnot, uh, which is pretty cool. They have like a, you know, a base of operations. He's got a big padlock on like a, you know, hidden treasury or whatever. I think they even have like a weapon, uh, an arsenal, uh, if you will. And I'm not talking about, um, whatever, I can't remember his name. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, like he has unique characters who join him. Um, Little John obviously is a big guy, you know, Dig is way bigger than Oliver. Um, and he's kind of in that second in command position and, you know, they have this tight bond. Um, and then, like I said, he ends up getting a whole array of characters around him who are unique and, you know, they all work with him and they all do his brand of work, his, you know, vigilante type stuff, but they're all, you know, all a little different, all have their own little spin on them. And it's interesting, like Friar Tuck is an interesting dude. Um, you know, he's a religious man, but like he wears armor under his robes and stuff and like he's pretty strong and they fight and, uh, you know, he's got his own quirky personality and like all of the characters are like, they're real characters and they shine. Like I said, there's the, the faceless, you know, 120 or so, uh, maybe 130, you know, uh, of his, you know, stout yeomen who were part of the Mary, the band of Merry Men, but then there's those guys who stand out. Um, and I don't know, it's just really interesting, uh, how that works out, um, yeah, and it's, uh, like, I think you can take a lot from both of them. Like, I was really, I've I've been moved uh, several times watching uh, Arrow because there's just some real emotionally resonant stuff in there and there's some, like, life lessons. And, you know, while one of them is a, you know, it's eight years or 13 years, maybe, I guess. if you Yeah, technically, like, 13 years in the life of Oliver Queen, tracking, like, his growth as a person and how he changed and how he's inspired people around him. You know, I don't know how long uh, Robin Hood was doing his thing in Pyle's book, but, you know, it tracks him over his life, and there is some change in him, and there's some emotional depth, but, like, more the lessons come from, like, specific adventures that they have versus an Arrow, you know, because it was a weekly running TV show, they had the luxury of just having, you know, an adventure and an ongoing, you know, mystery or villain or whatever stretching out over the entire series, and they had little, you know little crimes and whatnot that they would stop in between versus, um, the book had to be a lot shorter. You know, there aren't, I don't know how many episodes there were total of Arrow, maybe probably north of a hundred. Um, and versus, you know, there's only 21 chapters in Pyle's book. And I think the total length of the book is, I don't even know, eight hours long or something like that. Some of the chapters are like 45 minutes and some of them are a lot shorter. I'm actually going to go over to my LibriVox app right now and check that out. Um, let's see. so does it tell me how long the book actually is? It says it's 11 hours. So that's decently long. I mean, if you watched all of Arrow, uh, let's say they're 45 minutes times hundred episodes, it's, you know, it's a lot of time. I can't, I can't do that math right now. Sorry, but it's definitely more than 11 hours. Cause like, you know, a season would have been, it would have exceeded the length of, of 11 hours. So, um, I think they both do a really good job of telling a story. And if you like 
uh, arrow and you're looking for something a little more in that vibe and you want to get to the roots, I would definitely check out uh, The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. And if you like uh, listening to books instead of reading them, then I would definitely check out uh, The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood by Howard Pyle over on LibriVox. Uh, I think almost everybody does like a knockout job of doing the performances in the book. Oh, there's songs in the book. <laughs> there was never a musical episode of Arrow, as I can remember, but there are songs in uh, the book, and some of the readers even sing them or chant them or whatever, which is a delight in some ways. Um, although maybe that's just something I like, because I encountered that first in The Hobbit, uh, which I just listened to like a couple months ago, and I was surprised to find that Tolkien put a bunch of songs in there, uh, which was a lot of fun. Anyway, I don't really have much else to say. Um, except for, uh, I like both of these things and I'm sort of interested in checking out some of Pyle's other work or actually what I meant to say, step back. I'm interested in checking out other, uh, stories of Robin Hood. Um, there's a young Robin Hood and you need to check out who that's from, but that's on LibriVox and I might be interested in, uh, seeing that to get the flashbacks of, uh, Robert's life to see what it was like and how he learned to be, uh, such a great archer and whatnot. Um, but Howard Pyle uh, has books on King Arthur. There's at least two. There's a four volumes, but there's at least two on LibriVox that I could find. Uh, the app doesn't work as well as like the website, um, so I might look there for more later, and uh, I can report back on those at some point. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this kind of uh, spur of the moment conversation or, or discussion of these, you know, two stories about archers who help the little guy. And, uh, that if you have never checked out a Robin Hood book that you would, uh, give this one a chance. And if you checked it out on my uh, recommendation, let me know what you thought of it. And if you can think of any more parallels that I left out, if you've, uh, you know, experienced both, um, the show and the book, uh, let me know what you have to say. If you enjoyed this, like, comment, and share to help me grow. Don't forget to subscribe to keep current with each release. Chat with me on Twitter at MJ underscore scribe. Visit mjmunoz.com slash podcasts to find the multiple feeds in which I analyze Star Wars, Tokusatsu, comics, and more. Visit mjmunoz.com slash support for links to my Redbubble and coffee pages so you can help me keep doing the things I do. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Until next time, be well, and may you find the strength to be the hero you needed in your most desperate hour.